All right. Thanks everyone for allowing me to present this case. Um, so I have an interesting case of a 31 year old female with not any significant past medical history who initially presented to her outpatient provider with just a cough. Um, she was diagnosed with bronchitis, given a short course of antibiotics and steroids and sent home. She went home several days later. She still wasn't feeling better. She went back to the hospital with um, lethargy, myalgias, headache, dry cough. On initial examination, they uh, found her to have hyperreflexia. There was infectious workup that was done that was pretty bland. CT head uh, was negative, um, and they presumed that she had viral uh, or aseptic meningitis and admitted her to the hospital and started treating her empirically. Um, interestingly enough, uh, she, during that hospital course, uh, went to have an abdominal ultrasound. And on her way back from the alt abdominal ultrasound, she started seizing. Um, and uh, she was having generalized tonic-clonic seizures and had ultimately uh, needed to be loaded uh, with anti-epileptic medications and needed to be intubated for concern for status epilepticus. Ultimately, she was transferred over to Duke for a higher level, level of care and transferred directly to the ICU, uh, placed on continuous EEG, uh, LP was completed, MRI was completed, ID consulted. Um, when she came to Duke, she was febrile. Um, her LP showed eight nucleated cells with a lymphocytic predominance. Um, her initial infectious workup was pretty bland and her continuous EEG uh, showed GPDs and some diffuse background slowing. Um, interestingly, on imaging, uh, the initial imaging that was done showed uh, patchy leptomeningeal enhancement, uh, but later imaging actually showed some T2 hyperintense signal in the basal ganglia. So she had a pretty long ICU course, um, almost 20 days, um, and throughout that course, she had cyclical fevers, delirium, persistent tachycardia. She received empiric treatment with antivirals, antibiotics, antifungals, and even received IVIG. Um, but about 20 days into her ICU course, uh, she had sporadically improved mental status, started following commands intermittently, and ultimately got extubated and was started on steroids at that point. Um, during this course, additional workup was done, uh, a pan scan was done uh, with no acute findings or masses, uh, flow was sent, uh, which showed increased lymphocytes, but no abnormalities. And eventually um, her autoimmune encephalitis panel came back positive for GFAP. Um, so at that point, it was felt that uh, the patient's presentation fit with GFA GFAP meningoencephalitis. So, a little bit more about GFAP. Um, so GFAP is a glial fibrillary acidic protein uh, that's a primary com component of intermediate filaments. It's highly expressed in the cytoplasm of mature astrocytes and has important roles um, in modulating shape, motility, uh, formation of the blood brain barrier and uh, regulating the function of the synapse. Um, GFAP, um, uh, autoimmune GFAP um, meningoencephalitis and occasionally myelitis uh, can present with headache, abnormal vision, fever, psychosis, ataxia, autonomic dysfunction. Uh, it's usually accompanied by pleocytosis and elevated protein in the CSF. Um, about a quarter of people with GFAP uh, have a concurrent neoplasm and about half of those that have ne uh, these neoplasms tend to have an ovarian teratoma. And this makes uh, imaging very important. Um, one interesting finding in GFAP um, is this pretty, uh, not pathognomonic, but common finding of linear perivascular radial enhancement on T1 contrasted imaging uh, that you can see right here. Um, on spinal MRI, you can also see longitudinally extensive T2 hyperintense lesions. So there's not yet consensus on treatment uh, for GFAP, but it is known that it's very steroid responsive. Um, most patients do have a monophasic illness, but some do have relapses. Um, so for our patient, uh, she completed a five-day course of IV steroids and was ultimately discharged on uh, prednisone and uh, immunosuppression as well to prevent relapse. Uh, at the end of her 
hospital course, she was extubated, awake, alert oriented, uh, speaking in full sentences. She had full strength in all of her extremities, was walking, uh, and she was discharged to acute rehab. Uh, she's gonna follow with us outpatient. Um, so she had a pretty promising course. And here I have uh, an image of another patient from a case report um, who had a very similar presentation, was treated with IVIG and IV steroids. And you can see her radiographic improvement one month after onset and 16 months after onset. Uh, this patient was discharged on prednisone and also uh, immunosuppression with mycophenolate. Um, so overall, uh, good outcomes uh, for our patients. Thank you, Swapna. It's a great case and a great outcome. So today we have a, a speaker who's often associated with great outcomes. It's our own Kyle Mitchell who's an assistant professor of neurology in the movement disorders division. I think we all think of Kyle as our DBS person. Uh, Kyle uh, went to Vanderbilt College and then the Medical College of Georgia, was a resident in neurology at WashU in St. Louis before doing his fellowship at UC San Francisco. We were very fortunate to get him and Snea as a package in 2018. Both of them have been fantastic. And today, Kyle is going to talk to us about uh, closing the loop, adaptive deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. So Kyle, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Rich, for that introduction. And also wanna extend a warm welcome to our applicants who are on the talk today. Um, hope you get a little bit of impression of what Duke is like, even though, of course, we'd love to have you here in person. Um, so today I'll be speaking about my primary clinical and research interest, which is, uh, of course, improving deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's disease. Um, here's a list of my disclosures, just trying to juggle my windows here. Um, relevant disclosure, I think, to this talk is support for Medtronic. I mentioned that because they provided the research devices to Duke that are going to be highlighted in this talk. Um, are my slides coming through okay? Yep. Looks good, okay, great. Um, so here's an outline of my talk. I'll be focusing on the following. Um, first, what is DBS and why are we doing it? Um, then some historical data on how effective DBS is for Parkinson's disease. And along with that, some limitations and challenges uh, with DBS for PD. Um, I'll then switch gears and get into research and talk about prior work in the development of adaptive DBS, as well as recent data um, from Duke in our exciting adaptive DBS trial. So as many of you know, we have great treatments for many of the motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease, um, like tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, and levodopa, which has been a mainstay of PD treatment for uh, decades since the 1960s um, provides really a robust response in many patients for these symptoms, um, with some exceptions. Um, unfortunately, though, as the disease process progresses, the therapeutic window for levodopa and PD narrows, and patients will develop what's known as motor fluctuations. Uh, I'm going to get my laser pointer here. Um, and that's where they bounce between excessively off and excessively on times, off being more immobile, stiff, tremoring, um, excessively on having dyskinesia, maybe dystonia, um, looks like a skateboarder in this, in this cartoon here. Um, and that, that window where they are optimally treated is really kind of transient. And people will develop rapid fluctuations where they have multiple cycles throughout the course of the day of being on and off uh, meds despite optimizing uh, L-DOPA, despite adding additional medications. And so it's in these uh, situations where we can't get a hold of things with medicines, but we know the symptoms respond that we'll consider more advanced options like surgery. And surgery for Parkinson's actually started even before the use of L-DOPA. Um, the only treatment for PD back in the 50s was unilateral pallidotomy and then later thalamotomy, um, which was uh, performed by neurosurgeons by direct lesioning of those targets. Um, in order to make sure that the right spot was being lesioned before a permanent lesion was made, surgeons would send electrical impulses um, down a wire to look for side effects. Um, 
Side effects could be things like face pulling or dysarthria, for example, if the internal capsule was being stimulated uh, instead of the intended target. And doing this allowed a surgeon to then readjust uh, before making that permanent lesion. What was interesting is during these localization procedures, a couple of discoveries were made. Um, Dr. Benabid in Grenoble, France, found that when he used high frequency stimulation um, in the thalamus, when just trying to localize, he was actually reversibly suppressing tremor even prior to lesion formation. Simultaneously over at Emory, Dr. Malin DeLong uh, was looking at primate models of Parkinson's disease and uh, delivering high frequency stimulation and discovered an additional target, which is the subthalamic nucleus or STN. Um, and together, these discoveries led uh, ultimately to the first fully implantable stimulators uh, in PD for the now routine brain targets like the BIM thalamus, the STN, and the globus pallidus pars interna, or GPI. Um, so these were the groundbreaking uh, studies that led to the first um, DBS uh, deep brain stimulators in people. So what does DBS actually look like? Well, if you haven't been to the OR with me or Dr. Cooney, um, here's a little cartoon example. Um, on the figure on the left, you can see a burr hole uh, with a about one and a half millimeter diameter electrode going down through the frontal lobe white matter um, to the target of choice. Here you have an example of GPI. Uh, here you have an example of STN. Um, the tip of the electrode has four stimulating contacts, or I should say at least four stimulating contacts now. And it's through those stimulating contacts that we can customize frequency, pulse width, amplitude, and then just contact configuration to deliver individualized therapy to a patient. Um, and here on the right, you can see post-op MRI of, of uh, lead placement in the STN and the GPI. Um, I think also of note is um, all of this is within, uh, you know, with under the skin, within the body. Um, so the lead is placed, it's capped by this burr hole, it tracks under the scalp behind the ear um, to a small computer just near the clavicle um, called an implantable pulse generator or IPG. And it's this small computer that is the power source, but also allows us to customize the therapy uh, for, our, for our patients. And DBS has, has uh, proven to be very effective for specific indications in Parkinson's disease. Um, this is best illustrated by a couple of pivotal trials um, that were published in the mid-2000s, uh, which both show that DBS improves the amount of daily on or that good sweet spot time uh, per day um, without the expense of bothersome dyskinesia. Um, both of these trials are randomized controlled trials for the treatment of moderate to advanced PD with motor fluctuations, um, despite maximal medical management. Um, and they were, uh, participants were randomized to either DBS or ongoing uh, medical management. The United States trial included both STN and GPI targets. Um, and the primary outcome was quite significant, about four and a half hours of additional good time per day um, compared to pre-op and compared to the med management group. Um, some secondary outcomes that were also met were about a 25% reduction in medication compared to pre-op, um, as well as motor improvement, even when uh, medication had worn off just with DPS alone. Similar results were seen in a large European trial, um, this time with only STN as a target. Um, and the bottom panel here really highlights the improvement. So on the left, we have the DBS group. On the right, we have the med management group alone. We have pre-op and then six months later, or just baseline and six months later for medicines. And the, the key point is this light green uh, part here, which expands about four and a half hours of additional on time per day. And where does that time come from? Well, it comes from the severe off time, that immobile time reduces by about four hours, as does um, excessive dyskinesia. Whereas in the bed management group alone, there's no difference in, uh, in motor symptoms. The study also revealed that numerous quality of life measures were significantly better in the DDS group compared to med management group. And those included things like uh, quality of life, mobility, activities of daily living, emotional well being and several others.
So I think I've shown you that DBS is effective, but it comes with some important caveats and limitations. Um, DBS is only known to be effective in really a highly screened subgroup of PD patients. Um, so this flow sheet um, shows the complex decision-making decision that goes into selecting an appropriate surgical candidate. I'm not gonna go through every point here, um, but I am gonna go through some key points. Um, the patient needs to either have a clear response to L-DOPA, which is quantified by at least a 30% improvement in motor disability score with L-DOPA, uh, or they need to have medication refractory tremor um, or some kind of medication limiting side effect where the, the L-DOPA is, is helping, um, but they're not able to get up to a therapeutic dose due to nausea or dyskinesia or dystonia. Um, and so those are the main factors that go into DBS candidacy, but there's also quite a bit of workup involved. Um, we bring patients into the clinic and we need to see them off medicine and on medicine to quantify that improvement with L-DOPA. Um, we also need to have some counseling sessions regarding expectations for DBS. And during these sessions, it's repeatedly emphasized that DBS is not a cure. It's not a disease modifying therapy. It doesn't make you feel like you're 20 again. Um, you may not look like that amazing YouTube video you saw of, of someone with DBS. Um, on the other hand, uh, DBS has very specific goals of alleviating tremor or motor fluctuations or both. Also in this workup, uh, it's critical that patients undergo neuropsych testing. Um, and this is because DBS clearly worsens patients with dementia or with significant cognitive issues bordering on dementia. And the reason for this is these patients have poor outcomes, particularly poor cognitive outcomes with DBS. And so they're not considered candidates for the surgery. Um, another issue is severe gait issues or prominent gait symptoms. Um, these can often be the most disabling symptom in PD, um, but unfortunately they don't tend to improve like some of the other symptoms with DBS. Um, so if we see a patient who is wheelchair bound or maybe having very frequent falls and those are what they want to improve with DBS, they're not going to be considered candidates because um, there'd be an extremely low likelihood of any improvement in those areas. Um, now, there are some palliative exceptions. You can imagine someone who is um, very limited from a gait standpoint, but that has severe tremor um, that's impairing quality of life that could still be considered, but certainly not the norm. Um, so in summary, DBS is great for Parkinson's, but, but really up to a point and really for specific motor symptoms that need to be clarified before surgery. I've mentioned some relatively strict DBS candidacy requirements, and there's also a lot of areas for improvement and optimization in DBS, um, even in its current form. Um, so, so some limitations. Um, the first one is that DBS involves continuous stimulation, like a metronome, albeit a very fast metronome. Um, a neurologist will set up custom settings in the clinic and then leave them alone until the next appointment. Um, that's great, but as we know, Parkinson's symptoms fluctuate from hour to hour um, and also worsen as time goes on. So that's probably not ideal to have one unchanging setting for every patient, even with those periodic adjustments in clinic. Another issue is that programming is time intensive. Um, even uh, expert trained programmers are still at, at, a, at its core performing trial and error brute force techniques um, for manual adjustments, um, kind of like a educated guess and check to see how a patient is doing. Um, the problem with that is there's many, many permutations of DBS settings and it's impossible to go through all of those. Another limitation is DBS needs to be very accurate. Um, so being off even a couple of millimeters um, can cause stimulation of neighboring structures like the internal capsule, for example, which can cause side effects, which will limit the therapy. Um, as I've already mentioned, gait symptoms um, can be the most disabling motor symptom in PD, and they don't always respond to DBS and often don't. Um, and then finally, DBS is really a niche specialty. Um, and there aren't specialty DBS centers um, in rural areas, and many patients have to travel quite a, quite a distance to get care. And so you can imagine that it's harder to get truly optimized, individualized DBS therapy if you don't have that degree of access, um, because it's hard to find uh, expert clinicians uh, for this. Um, 
as a whole, these limitations, I think, just show us that there's a lot of work to be done to be optimizing and individualizing this therapy for our patients. And in addition to these limitations, um, DBS technology has really rapidly expanded in recent years, which I think is at least partially due to more competition from multiple different manufacturers in the space. Um, and so DBS optimization has become even more complicated. On the left, you can see the, the old leads, the prior four contact leads. Um, those are on all now at least eight contact leads with segmented leads, allowing for directional steering of current. Um, the new hardware also comes with new stimulation frequencies that weren't previously possible, or new pulse widths, which is the duration of each electrical, electrical impulse is now available. And so with these uh, improvements, the number of permutations of DBS parameters has expanded from the tens of thousands um, just a few years ago to now in the millions. But as clinicians, we're primarily just using the old techniques, again, of brute force trial and error. Um, I bring this up not to be pessimistic, but to say we've got these awesome technological advances. We can really individualize therapy for our patients, but we need to find better ways of using uh, these technological advances to get there. So I'm gonna switch gears now and, and focus on research and talk about potential solutions to these issues. Um, so one potential solution is the development of what's being called closed loop or adaptive DBS. Um, in other words, a self-regulating DBS, which can change on the fly. And I'm gonna focus on that for the remainder of this talk. Um, the goal of adaptive DBS is to stimulate only when needed and then turn off or ramp down when it's not needed. Um, there's a couple of good comparators to this. Um, I think in its most basic form, a thermostat is kind of what we're looking at. Um, so we have a temperature that's set and then heating and cooling will automatically trigger when certain temperature thresholds are reached. Um, a little fancier version is already available in neurology um, with responsive neurostimulation or RNS and epilepsy. Um, this involves a bi-directional stimulator, so a stimulator that can both simultaneously record brain signals and stimulate. Um, and it works by recording EEG signals and then stimulating a cortical brain focus when pathological EEG signals are encountered that may indicate an impending seizure. I think to develop similar technology in Parkinson's disease, there's some key needs, um, which I'll go through now. The first big need is we need a brain signal or some kind of signal which correlates with Parkinson's symptoms in real time. Um, this could be a peripheral sensor like a smartwatch accelerometer that can measure tremor, slowness, gait speed, um, or it can be a neural signal, um, something along the lines of RNS that can directly measure neural activity but we need those neural signals to correlate with Parkinson's symptoms for them to be useful uh, in closed loop DBS. Um, next, we need an algorithm that can uh, individualize and titrate stimulation based on these signals. And then third, we need hardware that can handle all of this. Um, fortunately, progress has been made on all three of these points, um, which I will now go into. Um, so our first need was we needed signals. Um, the most studied neural signal for Parkinson's disease in recent years is uh, local field potentials or LFPs. Um, and these can be recorded from motor cortex, but also in deeper structures in the basal ganglia like the STN or GPI. Um, the figure here is showing what LFPs are. And in essence, they are a measure of neuronal populations firing together. Um, What's interesting is that in the basal ganglia, these populations of cells have a tendency to oscillate or fire together in an oscillating fashion, which creates these sinusoidal LFPs at a certain frequency. And so you can see this is neurons spiking together um, about every 0.1 seconds. And then the LFP looks like this nice regular sinusoidal uh, tracing at 10 Hertz frequency. How is this useful? Well, in Parkinson's disease, um, researchers have found that beta frequency LFPs between 13 and 30 Hertz correlate pretty well with both rigidity and bradykinesia. So that's a potential biomarker. Um, another promising signal is another peak in a gamma frequency around 70 Hertz, which pretty tightly correlates with dyskinesia. So it looks like we might have a biomarker for too little movement, but also too much movement. Um, I think, 
what makes these LFPs even more useful is the fact that they, they correlate with Parkinson's symptoms, but also change with effective Parkinson's treatment, uh, which makes them potentially useful for closed loop DBS. So for example, both levodopa and DBS reduce beta frequency activity and that correlates with motor improvement. Um, so you can see this in a figure on the right here. Um, in gray, you have treatment off, we'll call it DBS off. The patient is rigid, bradykinetic, and you can see there's this large beta frequency peak um, correlating with the, the motor status. When DBS is switched on, um, that peak attenuates and concurrently the patient has improved mobility. Um, you can also see this uh, on the flip side with too much movement with gamma frequency activity. Um, if the patient has no dyskinesia, let's say they're at an optimal motor state or maybe they just haven't taken their meds, uh, there's no gamma frequency peak. Um, however, when the patient develops dyskinesia, either due to maybe ST and DBS at too high of an amplitude or um, excessive levodopa, you get this nice narrow um, gamma peak, which correlates with those symptoms. Um, so with these LFPs, we can check off our first need uh, for adaptive DBS, which is signals that correlate with Parkinson's symptoms as well as tremor, uh, as well as um, a treatment response. So the second need uh, for adaptive DBS is we need an algorithm which can ramp stimulation up when it's needed. Uh, so for example, when beta frequency activity is high um, and then ramp stimulation down when it's not needed, when beta frequency activity is low or maybe when gamma frequency activity is encountered. And this figure shows how that algorithm would work. Um, so step one, you're gonna record brain signals um, using the implantable pulse generator. Uh, step two, those, those signals are processed into LFPs or, or maybe other types of biomarkers. Um, then if those biomarkers reach a certain threshold, the algorithm will automatically decide whether um, stimulation should be ramped up or down and the settings will automatically change. And then the loop continues, constantly recording, adjusting and stimulating. Um, and so this model of closed loop DBS uh, may finally allow us to have that self-regulating stimulator for Parkinson's disease that we're seeking. And this kind of algorithm has already been trialed with some success. Um, some earlier work with adaptive DBS uh, proved that um, using such an algorithm can work. Um, these studies didn't have the hardware we have today uh, so they involved using externalized leads uh, almost immediately post-operatively. So the leads were attached from the brain target um, directly to a research computer. So they weren't tucked in under the scalp and tucked into the chest wall. This was before everything was fully internalized. And the research computer uh, would record beta frequency LFPs and was designed to perform uh, adaptive DBS based on predetermined beta activity thresholds. Um, What's pretty cool is this not only worked, but it also proved to be more effective than continuous standard DBS, at least in this uh, post-op setting, um, and even being at the same stimulation configuration as the continuous DBS. Um, they also included a random DBS pattern, which would be a non-regular DBS pattern as a control measure. And as you can see from this figure, um, both the blinded and the unblinded ratings uh, indicated that adaptive DBS was more effective than standard DBS, and then random DBS, the control group, was just ineffective. So the study was groundbreaking um, and, and very promising uh, in that it showed that adaptive DBS might be feasible and it might actually be superior to standard DBS. Um, it also helped point out some limitations to adaptive DBS in this, in this format. So first, I think the most obvious thing is this was done with a research computer um, and didn't have to deal with uh, stimulation related electrical artifact. They also excluded patients with tremor because tremor actually artificially reduces beta signal uh, and may limit its efficacy as a biomarker. So these were patients that were only um, having significant rigidity or bradykinesia. And then finally, this was done uh, in the short term only because hardware capabilities at that time, capabilities at that time did not allow for chronic adaptive DBS. And so that leads us to adaptive DBS uh, need number three. Um, 
which is DBS hardware that can be chronically implanted and both record and stimulate simultaneously. Um, fortunately, this is now available uh, as both a research device and clinically, um, although the clinically available device has that adaptive capa capability locked uh, and restricted to approved research studies only. Um, but this is an exciting development uh, and it allows for us to perform long-term studies of adaptive DBS. And so with all of those needs met, we were able to start studying adaptive DBS in a pilot clinical trial at Duke. I'll point out this is uh, work from a collaborative group uh, with neurosurgery, neurology, and engineering. Um, a very large team uh, with, with a lot of kind of key contributors on, on all sides. Um, what's novel about this trial is we actually used four leads per patient. So one in each globus pallidus and one in each STN. And there's, um, there's a few reasons for this. Um, it's also important to note that the research hardware we have does allow us to record and stimulate from any and all of those brain leads. But why did we do four leads per patient? Um, well, first, there has been some prior work indicating that additional leads may provide additional symptom relief. But I think the, the main reasons we did this um, was we should be able to discover new biomarkers by recording from multiple sites in a circuit rather than, than just a single target. Also, we should be able to mitigate some of the limitations seen in the prior studies um, by recording from a site that's separate from the stimulating site. So it shouldn't have that same degree of artifact. Um, also, we're wondering about limitations from prior studies. Like for example, that beta activity was attenuated with tremor. Could that really be useful? Uh, we hypothesize that recording from multiple sites in the circuit may, uh, may help mitigate some of those uh, issues. Um, I'm listing the inclusion criteria here. Um, so we enrolled six total participants for this pilot study. Um, the other enrollment criteria are pretty standard for any DBS related trial. Um, they were under 75 years of age at enrollment, uh, at least four years of symptoms of Parkinson's disease, at least 30% improvement without levodopa, which is pretty standard for any DBS implantation. Um, and then motor fluctuations despite medication optimization or medication refractory tremor. Again, standard for DBS. We also did a MOCA and neuropsych testing for every patient um, to make sure that their cognitive status was good enough for surgery. So here's some data on our participants. Um, they're bet uh, between 55 and 65 and had Parkinson's for around 10 years prior to enrollment. The average improvement with levodopa was 40% uh, prior to surgery, and participants were taking over 900 milligrams of L-dopa per day on average pre-op, uh, which is a fairly high dose, but I would say commonly seen before DBS. Um, this is my favorite figure, which shows our lead location, and it's based on uh, post-op head CT with the leads uh, merged with pre-op brain MRI. Uh, with a software which generates models of the basal ganglia. And what you can see here is that our lead placement was accurate and the leads were confirmed to be in the inspected nuclei based on imaging. Uh, so in this patient, you can see two leads in the subthalamic nucleus in orange, really in the dorsolateral portion. Um, and then you can see two leads spanning both the GPE in blue and GPI in green. Um, Two contacts were placed in, in the GPE and two were in the GPI to allow for recordings in both of those structures, because um, as we know, both of those are involved in basal ganglia circuitry. Um, and then the red nuclei are here in red, just, just for reference to show where we are in the midbrain here. So we now have blinded one-year outcomes from our first three patients, which are presented here. Um, so before I get into that, just talking about our, our programming strategies. Um, in the months after lead implantation, each patient underwent extensive programming, first of the bilateral SDN, then they would come back, get bilateral GPI programmed, and then finally they'd come back and get all four leads programmed. And then we'd kind of tweak and optimize each setting as we went along. Um, at one year, we tested each patient under each stimulation condition, both off and on medication. And our results, uh, have showed improvement compared to off stimulation with all stimulation conditions, 
um, but really a trend towards the largest degree of improvement when all four leads were activated simultaneously. So that STN plus GP that you can see in dark blue, um, you can see there's a trend towards this having the lowest score um, in these blinded ratings, um, indicating fewer motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Um, as a preview, I don't have the data yet, the blinded data yet for the final three patients, um, but our unblinded ratings showed a similar response uh, and similar um, significant improvement with dual stem compared to single site stem. In addition to those motor score improvements, there were several other secondary outcomes which have been collected. Um, so daily levodopa dosing was reduced quite a bit by about 65% on average. Um, what I have on the left here is the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale Part 4, which is a scale for complications of medications like dyskinesia, fluctuations, and side effects. And you can see that improved across all six participants. Um, I think perhaps most importantly, our participants were given the ability to, to toggle groups with the stimulator at home. So they could toggle between SCN only, GPI only, or dual stimulation. Um, and by one year, all six participants preferred dual site stimulation to single target settings. Participants also gained a large amount of daily on time. Um, so that this again is the amount of time that participants are more functional and mobile during the day. Um, this is calculated by self-report with participants completing a three-day Hauser diary. Um, so a Hauser diary is where clinical state is rated every 30 minutes. Um, and participants can choose between excessive dyskinesia, just feeling on, kind of optimal, uh, off, uh, or asleep. And as you can see on average, our participants had improvement in daily on time uh, from 27% to almost 85%, which is really um, quite a large improvement, um, particularly because this is compared to one year prior. Uh, and as we know, Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disease. And you can see every single patient, uh, every single participant improved in the amount of on time per day. There were some notable adverse events um, that uh, should be mentioned. Um, one participant had a small cortical hemorrhage, which was noted post-op on imaging and was complicated by a single seizure. Um, this did resolve spontaneously on follow-up imaging, um, and this participant did not have any recurrence of seizures. However, um, the participant was on an anti-epileptic drug for three months before that was weaned. Um, there was no change from neurologic baseline after that event. Um, another participant had scarring at the DBS extension site in the neck, um, which required a surgical correction and lengthening of the connector. Um, this was felt likely due to the bulky extension needed to accommodate all four leads. Um, and then one participant had leg dyskinesia, um, even when the stimulation and medications were stopped. That lasted about two weeks before spontaneously resolving. Um, this can occur, albeit rarely, with SCN um, DBS in general, um, but worth noting on this study as well. Um, and I'll mention that although these complications had no long-term sequelae, um, there may be an additional risk for, for dual target stimulation. In addition to our clinical outcomes, we now have promising data in biomarker discovery, and we're able to start trials of adaptive DBS in, this, in these participants, which has really been the big goal of all of this. Um, so as I mentioned, there were some limitations in prior studies using beta frequency as LFPs and needing to exclude participants with tremor. Um, we didn't find these limitations with our dual site recording and stimulation. Um, all of our patients had measurable tremor and all of them had this nice response um, to, uh, to, to beta frequency signal. Um, so the panel on the right shows an LFP recording of one of our participants with DBS off in black. You can see that nice beta frequency peak and then DBS on in blue with dual stimulation. And so you can see that likely pathological beta frequency signal attenuates with effective DBS delivery. And as I've previously shown you, that correlated with uh, improvement in motor symptoms. Our recordings have also indicated that beta activity may be an even more robust biomarker during this dual target stimulation. Um, in particular, when we're recording from the STN lead, but we're stimulating from both, uh, we found that beta signal more reliably reduces um, 
when uh, both targets are being stimulated as opposed to one alone. And you can see that on the uh, left part of this figure where beta power uh, or beta activity, in other words, is reduced further with STN plus GPI stimulation um, than it is with single target alone. Um, we didn't get that same result when we were recording from the GPI. So it seems like the sweet spot for this biomarker is recording from STN, but stimulating from both uh, targets. Um, we found that we didn't have issues with tremor or artifact in doing this. So we hypothesized that um, this beta frequency LFP may be an even more robust biomarker uh, with this dual site stimulation and recording. Um, and it may be able to be used uh, effectively to set thresholds for chronic trials of adaptive DBS in our participants. And so we have started doing that uh, with some in-person research trials of adaptive DBS um, using an algorithm that determines stimulation amplitude based on beta uh, signal amplitude. So I'll go through this figure. Um, you can see the beta frequency signal in blue uh, and the DBS amplitude in orange. Uh, as that beta frequency signal starts to creep up, stimulation automatically responds and increases and kind of meets beta signal as it's increasing and ultimately suppresses the beta signal back to a kind of a healthier state. Um, and you can see over the course of about 20 minutes, this happens uh, a couple of times. Um, so this is showing us that we can get this adaptive stimulation algorithm to work. Um, and it does seem to effectively uh, ramp up when beta increases and ramp down when beta uh, decreases. So we have a truly responsive uh, neurostimulation for Parkinson's disease. And so with this development, we're moving rapidly towards home trials of adaptive DBS uh, with a plan of comparing adaptive DBS to just standard clinically optimized DBS. Um, in addition to that, we're continuing to look for additional neurobiomarkers for use in adaptive DBS. Uh, one option being explored is using a combination of both neural and peripheral biomarkers, so something like an accelerometer or smartwatch, in addition to neural signals. And we're, we're going to continue to explore these as we develop and refine uh, adaptive DBS at Duke going forward. Um, I show this slide really to point out that this is truly an interdepartmental effort, and it's only possible with significant contributions from neurosurgery, neurology, engineering, all listed here, and I'm sure I'm leaving people out as well. Um, but I want to point out that I'm really presenting uh, work from this entire group, and it's only possible with, with significant contributions from everyone here. Um, so with that, I will close, and uh, thanks everyone for listening. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Kyle. So. Um... Anyone with questions, just put your name or your question in the chat. Uh, Brad wants the CME code. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll look that up as soon as I ask uh, a question. So, uh, so it's Kyle- It's Zoodal, Z-U-D-D-A-L. You know, so one thing I've learned about putting things in chat, so if I put something in chat at 8.05, right? And then Brad tunes in at 8.15, he can't see what I put in at 8.05. It's, it's a weird thing about how Zoom operates. Um, so Kyle, when these companies hand you these, you know, really advanced uh, stimulating devices, way more than you'd ever need, what do they, how do they justify all these add-ons if they don't know where it's going or what they might do? And why does anyone pay for it? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is they're putting devices in researchers' hands to see if we can't make something excellent with what they've got. So kind of intentionally giving us these extra capabilities to see what we can do with it. But they don't um, charge the patient more for it? No, no. Okay. Yeah, with the thought that, you know, if something works well, they're going to be able to make money off of it in the future. I see. Well, that's interesting. Jody, you had a question? Yeah. Kyle, thank you. That was a really excellent presentation. Uh, so is there any research um, looking into how can we get this level of stimulation deep in the brain that isn't invasive? Yeah, great, great question. And I know um, Noreen Bakari is working on that quite a bit in dystonia. And certainly 
I would imagine that could be applied uh, in, in PD as well, um, using things like TMS. Um, and I think going deep isn't necessarily always the solution. Um, as long as we hit the circuit somewhere, it could potentially have an effect. So even stimulating motor cortex might have uh, a beneficial effect. Um, but I would, I would defer to Dr. Bakari on that. And just the follow-up, I think the reason I ask is I was thinking about our patients with functional neurological disorders and that uh, some of the research shows that uh, when they attempt to move that their motor excitability is uh, diminished when it should go up. And so when I think about populations like that, I don't think anyone's going to be too excited about doing something uh, that would be invasive. However, if we had a way to do that, that was non-invasive, um, you know, I, I think that would be a great possibility. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, certainly drops the activation energy to, to study additional targets and disease states mm -hmm. if we didn't have to go through an invasive surgery. Uh, Dr. Lalani, you had a comment and a question. Hey, Dr. Mitchell, thanks for the great talk. Um, I know you mentioned this a little bit, but um, there's been some work done with like peripheral recorders responding and then um, kind of feeding information into those um, DBS stimulators. Has there been work done to show how much symptomatic improvement there is from that compared to what you saw in your patients? Yeah, good question. Um, there's some nice studies looking at like essential tremor, for example, where, um, you know, stimulation ramps up when tremors encountered just with peripheral uh, monitors. There's nothing head to head comparing them. Um, and so it's really kind of just different way of attacking the same problem. Um, I think the reasoning behind using neural signals as opposed to peripheral signals is we'd like to anticipate that before it comes out. So let's get a signal for tremor or slowness before it physically manifests and change the simulation then instead of waiting for that peripheral marker to pick it out. But I think both could be effective. Um, uh, Kyle, it's just a bunch of comments that you did a great job and I can certainly attest to that. That was a wonderful, uh, both practical and research talk. And I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, applicants who are with us today. I'll be talking to you shortly. And everybody else, uh, have a great and safe day.